Welcome to this edition of The Technology Pill, a podcast that looks at technology's reshaping of our lives, and in particular, the different ways that governments and companies use technologies to increase their power. My name is Gus Hossein, and I'm the Executive Director of Privacy International. And today I'm talking to my colleagues, Ilya Siatitsa, who leads our work on government surveillance, and Caitlin Bishop, our campaigns officer. Whether it's Hong Kong, the USA, and every day across the world, people are taking visible public action. They have to be seen, heard, and often they must provoke to be noticed and listened to. So we are seeing as we open newspapers and go across news websites and across our social media, we're seeing photos and videos and and recordings of people of all ages, and yes, all ages, taking action. Most shocking for me was to see the photos of school children in Hong Kong being rounded up, still in their school uniforms. That's enough to etch on our memories forever. A core element of the right to protest is to do so without retribution. And yet, with the modern surveillance capabilities of the state and states across the world, your participation shall be logged, you will be identified, you will be followed before, to, at, and after protests. Even if you don't physically participate, you shall be monitored. This is a huge domain full of corporate and government actors, old and fancy new technologies, and a variety of laws, often a patchwork of safeguards and a lot of black holes. That's why I'm very grateful that my colleagues Elia and Caitlin are here to talk us through this. So I thought that one way of approaching this massive domain is to break it up based on um, the stages of a protest. Um, So what happens at the protest? So when we see these images of people um, and the uh, police reactions, what is the surveillance aspect of what's going on at the protest? But then we should also be looking at what happens consequent to the protest, what happens after the protest from a surveillance perspective. And then there's a whole selection of technologies and systems that are all about monitoring you before, after, and during the protest. And then there's the, the larger picture we can go to when we start talking about aggregation tools. So let's, let's start stage by stage by first focusing at the protest. Um, Ilya, can you talk us through some of the types of technologies that are, that are being seen, are being noted, or maybe are just in the background? Yes. Uh, hi, guys. Thank you. So a few of the technologies we've been seen and have been reported to be used in protests across the world right now is facial recognition. We also have seen automated number plate uh, recognition, which basically reads the uh, number plate of our cars. And we've also seen what it's often ref- referred to as invisi catchers or stingray, which is basically a device that copies uh, a mobile phone tower and redirects your phones towards its direct towards it. And then we've also seen the use of drones um, lately uh, during protests that uh, were traditionally used in military context. So one of the kind of increasingly concerning tools that police have available to them at protests is facial recognition. There's kind of two different kinds of facial recognition. There's live facial recognition, which is kind of done as things are happening. So on currently recording footage or kind of as people are being spotted. And then there's static facial recognition, which is when police can come back later and run uh, programs on recordings that they've collected. Facial recognition is currently in use definitely across the USA and one of the there are a couple of kind of big companies that are providing it but one of the I think it's fair to say worse ones is called Clearview AI which is being used by Minneapolis police which is has been one of the centers of protest in the US and where George Floyd was murdered by police it is available to hundreds of other local police departments and what Clearview did was scrape social media across the web for photos people have uploaded themselves to train and their AI and to inform their facial recognition. So if you've uploaded a selfie to Instagram or to Twitter or wherever, 
clearly you might have taken that and used it to create kind of a file on you essentially to allow you to be recognized in real time by police as many as uh, one in four police departments across the us can access some form of facial recognition and it looks like around databases of people's faces compiled by local police departments contain over half of american adults um, according to one study by uh, researchers at georgetown there's uh, some evidence that police in hong kong are also using facial recognition but to be honest finding the specific companies and the specific tools being used by police in Hong Kong has been really, really difficult. And it's really unclear as well what the separation is between police, um, the things pe police are able to use in China and the things police have been able to use in Hong Kong. Um, there does definitely seem to be some static facial recognition they have access to, um, but whether or not they have access to live facial recognition is unclear. Clearview in particular has been, have been active in a ton of countries, including loads in the EU, like Belgium, uh, Denmark, Finland, Slovenia, Sweden, um, and they have plans to expand into other countries, including Brazil, Colombia, and Nigeria, um, none of which are particularly, like we would be particularly comfortable with them operating in. In fact, we wouldn't be particularly comfortable with them operating anywhere. And yet they're being used at the moment in, amongst others, places, Minneapolis. Adding to uh, what you described, what is particularly concerning with uh, live facial recognition, or as often referred to as real-time facial recognition, is that it makes anonymity uh, virtually impossible. Uh, it is it basically scans our facial characteristics and records them, uh, and these are sensitive biometric data for each and every one of us that are then stored in police and corporate records that we can never take back. It is not, it is next to impossible unless you have access to some quite um, substantive uh, financial resources to change your face. Uh, this is not an option that people participating in protest have for sure. So the fact that while moving to exercise what is your civil rights to protest, uh, protest against your government, to criticize policies that you consider that they restrict your freedoms, the police and together with them quite often, and it's unclear, corporate and private entities get access to some of your most intimate details and that's your facial characteristics. It's also worth noting a lot of the technology isn't that good. Like a lot of the technology um, it is, isn't particularly effective. It often can, particularly with people of colour, confuses people, uh, you know, it doesn't accurately recognise them. Uh, the ACLU did a test on Amazon's uh, recognition software that they've sold to an indeterminate number of police departments that misidentified 28 members of Congress as criminals. Disproportionately, disproportionately the matches were false for um, both Black and uh, Latino members of Congress. Amazon said that, that, that they used the wrong settings, but it turned out later, actually, they were the standard settings. And you, you you have such little faith in in the industry. They're 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 working on that. Um, there are uh, there are there were stories about how Chinese firms uh, specializing in facial recognition were offering um, the service for free to Eastern African uh, governments, so that um, they could use the governments could use the facial recognition cameras and systems, and these Chinese firms could use all the images that they collected in order to train their, their AI systems to better recognize faces of uh, African Americans and Africans elsewhere around the world. So don't worry, there's a lot <laughs> of research and development going on to deal with the inequity. I mean, when it comes to research and development with facial recognition, one of the really concerning things that has popped up, particularly now that coronavirus has become, you know, one of the biggest kind of <laughs> ongoing issues is um, people are trying to retrain facial recognition to recognize people even if they're wearing a mask, which kind of strips one of the easier, I guess, protections that you get when you go to a protest, which is almost a public health kind of handy thing to do at the moment anyway, which is wear a mask. As facial recognition gets increasingly and 
terrifyingly sophisticated if it can recognize people through masks then you know it's almost like an ongoing kind of war of attrition like protesters wear a mask which many people do to protest anyway or because they need to for public health reasons facial recognition learns to recognize you through that mask where do protesters go next and then if facial recognition can just you know catch up that's a significant and terrifying concern actually with facial recognition there's one other thing to say which is that um san francisco actually already banned the use of facial recognition software by police which is it's the only city in the us i think to have done that but it does suggest there is hope like we don't have to put up with facial recognition just because technology moves forward doesn't mean police should have access to it but then the the other identifier out of protest if the facial recognition doesn't work be, whether it's because it's a um it's a poor technology that uh that only sounds sexy enough to um purchase but not actually deploy or um if the masks are temporarily confusing uh the technology there's always the potential of using mobile phone surveillance. Um, how about we focus a little bit on the IMSI catchers and the drones, because just something that came out in the news just today, actually, is that the, 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 the U.S. government has authorized the Drug Enforcement Agency to use drones around the protests. And the Drug Enf uh, Enforcement Agency's drones actually have, are, are known to have IMSI catchers on them. So their drones apparently can fly over a protest, use these fake cell phone tower technology, or whether you call them MC catchers or stingrays, and essentially gather up all the identifiers of every mobile phone in the area. It's worth pointing out quickly that stingrays are actually a brand name. So stingrays are a specific kind of MC catcher that are used by about 75 different police departments in around 27 states, according to the ACLU, ACLU and 14 different national agencies, including ICE, the FBI, IRS and DEA have used stingrays specifically. So even just looking at that one kind of kind of MC catcher, they're pretty heavily available across the US. And I, I was just wanted to find out that uh, it's not only in the US that we've seen them being used. Germany uh, uses them as well. We've seen them, they've been reported in Hong Kong, but even there have been heavy documentations that they've, reliable documentations that they've been used extensively in the UK as well. But the UK government infamously uh, refuses to acknowledge the existence of IMSI catchers, <laughs> which is uh, extraordinary. But it's also one of the one of the kind of trends like the across all of the surveillance tools that we'll be talking about um lack of transparency or weaseliness i guess when it comes to people asking about these forms of technology is like really really prevalent one of the police departments in the us that have been particularly guilty of that um are the nypd who frequently kind of evade attempts to discover what surveillance they're using and as far as i can tell um the nypd seem to be using pretty much anything going no uh this is a an excellent point caitlin I, it, the lack of transparency in the use of these technologies particularly in the context of protests uh, is terrifying and in, in the way that we we should be able to know what kind of technologies used during protests to collect our information. Uh, otherwise, we are not, we are, we, people won't feel comfortable in participating. If you don't know whether your face or your phone information is being collected, this is something that can really drive people away from protests. And a space where actually communicate, free communication is, is essential. And this is, this is the the chilling effect uh, concern that uh, that arises from surveillance, where if you know you're going to be watched um, or if you know you're going to be monitored uh, and logged, you may not want to participate in what is your your lawful right uh, to protest. It, um, and uh, this is almost like one of the core arguments, legal arguments, for the constraining of surveillance, and it's just alarming that it's so hard to even find out the types of technologies that are deployed. And with IMSI catchers, 
Um, so when your phone connects to an MC catcher thinking it's a normal uh, like cell tower, they collect a lot of information, including the unique identifier of your phone. So when it comes to going to a protest, the things you can do kind of to mitigate that risk are incredibly limited. Um, for one thing, because if you're at a protest, you kind of, you know, there's a strong chance you'll need your phone, if only, you know, to be able to um, make sure friends are okay, to make sure, you know, you keep track of the people you're with, um, and to keep yourself safe, to be able to record. I mean, some of the instances of police brutality, both in the US and, and in Hong Kong, have been really shocking, incredible, and disgusting, and they're being recorded with phones. So, you know, the answer isn't really just don't bring a phone to the protest because that's not viable and it kind of undermines a lot of the other things that you can do to keep yourself safe and to make sure that police are held accountable for the things that they're doing you know some people have suggested you know uh cash cash uh, pay, uh burner phones paid for in cash but that's not a viable option for a lot of people um so mc, ca MC catchers are kind of particularly particularly concerning i guess and, and what is more, certain types of IMSI catchers can actually intercept uh, your calls or messages. And that can actually have a serious impact on even the safety of people during protests. Um, if you're trying to communicate with uh, your loved ones to ensure them that, they, that you're safe, or if you want to, to find information on where the protest is happening, an IMSI catcher can prevent you from doing that. So it is essential to know whether they're using this type and any type of IMSI catcher during protests to be aware of what they're capable of doing in the process and be able to protect ourselves. It's another thing that undermines the efficacy of or usefulness of, of burner phones. If you know if you're using a if you're using a burner phone, they're not going to get the unique identifier of the phone that you normally carry with you, but they might still get messages to your mum saying, don't worry, I'm safe, you know, I'm coming home or whatever. Um, do, does, do encrypted uh, messaging apps like Telegram or WhatsApp or Signal kind of counter, counterbalance that or not? Do they not? It's tricky. Um, so these apps, uh, like, so when you're at a protest where there's a lot of congestion, and if there's the use of a stingray or an MZ catcher, there might be some uh, what is called downgrade attacks where uh, where your phone would normally use say 4G or 3G, they might downgrade you to 2G. Um, and which means your internet connectivity might not be as reliable. And Signal and Telegram and all these messaging apps tend to use the internet layer uh, uh, um, for communications. And so you might, fall back on just using plain old SMS, which is a highly insecure um, technology in which, as Ilya mentioned, some IMZ catchers can actually intercept the communications coming out of your, uh, your phone, particularly at SMS level and at voice. So it might actually be intentional to stop your, uh, your internet connectivity from allowing you to use these more relatively secure modes of communication. And actually, speaking of um, in those encrypted uh, forms of communication, Telegram in Hong Kong um, found a suspiciously timed uh, denial of service attack on their service that they thought was intended to disrupt um, the planning uh, and of protests and the use of Telegram during the protests in Hong Kong. And then there are, of course, those uh, alarming cases of the internet actually being shut down, which is what we saw all the way back in the, the Arab uprising uh, when Egypt shut down its mobile phone networks to avoid people being able to communicate whatsoever because that was all they had left. And we still have a number of countries and regions across the world where mobile phone um, uh, connectivity and internet connectivity is shut down specifically to stop people from organizing. So back on our journey, you, you've, you've gone to a protest, the cameras have captured your, your faces and stored them in systems for facial recognition or they're doing live facial recognition. Your mobile phone that you had to bring in order to organize, engage and seek uh, assistance, um, that's also been, the identifiers have been captured and possibly some of your communications have been uh, captured. And then, 
there's the potential that you actually get detained, that the police detain you and search you. And then what they find is your mobile phone. And then a whole new layer of surveillance gets applied from there. And that is the area of mobile phone um, searches and what we call phone extraction. That is when they get your phone, the authorities essentially can just plug it into one of their devices that will then essentially search it. Ilya, can you talk us through that a little bit? Uh, yes, sure. So um, phone extraction um, basically describes a device, uh, a device where governments around the world has been spending millions of dollars to acquire and which allows them to break into and extract data from mobile phones. This gives them access to any information uh, we have stored on our mobiles, uh, whether we are aware of it or not. So for instance, if uh, it can also extract data that uh, we thought we had deleted from it. So if you took some pictures and then you quickly delete them before uh, the police arrested you during a protest, they can still find the, the, those pictures. Uh, or they can also get extract all the conversation you had over, uh, over in your phone, with whom you spoke, uh, all the content you've stored in there, then they can, this also can provide them and get away to any information you've stored uh, in, in your cloud, because then you might highly probably have an app like Dropbox where police can, once unlocking your phone and extracting all the information, can get access to. Uh, so it's very intimate details uh, or even your health records. So police can extract all of that in a matter of uh, minutes with mobile phone extraction devices. And there has been very little transparency on the circumstances under which the police can uh, use these devices or have been using these devices. So there, uh, during protests, for instance, we've, uh, they've been increasingly reported to be used in the US most recently, but then also we, um, there have been reports also in Hong Kong. And so um, and it's important for people to understand, um, as Yulia was saying, like your phone has more data on it than you, you understand. So for instance, your iPhone records the locations you go to most. And so you may refuse to say where you live, but your phone will identify that and they'll be able to search your phone in order to find that. And for people who've been listening to our podcast for a while, um, we had a podcast back in February where we looked not just at mobile phone extraction, that is the data they get off your phone, but we also looked at cloud extraction, where when they search your phone, um, they also get essentially the keys to your accounts in the cloud. So the uh, authorities can then access uh, all the data you have on these other services. And that could be your social media, that could be your, your cloud files, it could be your photos. And interestingly, the services that, these, that the authorities use um, also allow them to continue to have access to these uh, services after uh, they've handed back your phone and you've gone on with your life. So they can continue to monitor you after the fact. So this is a, a, an extraordinarily powerful form of surveillance technology that is widely deployed, but we know so little about. But you're starting to see them pop up more and more. Um, we, we've heard that uh, some of the customers include the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, the Secret Service, and uh, local de uh, police departments uh, may have also purchased this type of uh, technology and you will also see them increasingly at borders across the world where you get stopped at the border and they, uh, they access your device again they just plug it in and get access to all this data that you didn't even know is there um it might be so uh even where local police departments haven't bought the actual extraction devices um there's some evidence that they kind of contact other agencies who let them use theirs like i think the dea have been uh, involved in providing that service to other police departments. But also that due to the opaque um, way in which they've been using it, 
there is very little information or procedures in place to ensure that, for instance, uh, the data that they've extracted initially gets deleted, um, uh, or that it doesn't then uh, be used for other purposes, and uh, there is very little clarity with regard to what they've been doing after the extraction has happened. And there's, and there was also a case. Uh, in uh, November 2018, where in uh, in Tanzania, the authorities seized the phones of uh, some uh, human rights uh, um, advocates and then started to text from their phones. So it's, it, there's also the highly manual, but also highly invasive um, methods that they're using to essentially do disinformation tactics by using your phone to, uh, to send tweets from you that aren't from you. And that is a nice segue to the other form of surveillance that takes place um, both before uh, and after uh, protests, and that is social media intelligence gathering, or what we, or what we call in, in the privacy and surveillance uh, uh, trade, we call um, SOCMIT. Uh, so, uh, what is SOCMIN, uh, social media intelligence? Uh, it refers to the monitoring and gathering of um, information from our social media platforms, whether we refer to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whether it is public or private groups or pages. Um, SOCMIN allows the authorities and companies to uh, scrape uh, to grab all the data uh, from the social media platforms and then that gives them the opportunity to analyze it extract immediate information they might need like for instance where we are at a certain point of time if we posted that but then also they can use this data to generate pro generate profiles and predictions about each and every of us and they can store this data in uh, for future use as well. So um, the power of stock mint monitoring uh, shouldn't be underestimated. It, it is quite often been said that if you publish something on your social media platforms, you should have expected that someone will be will be watching and that there shouldn't be any expectation of privacy. But uh, this couldn't be far from the truth, actually. Uh, when we, uh, even in public spaces, there is a certain degree of expectation of privacy. When you post one opinion on a specific article or a protest that is happening, you expect that to be uh, seen by the people you interact with and you don't expect it to be analyzed compared to what you said before, or even make further inferences with regard to what you're thinking from it. Uh, and this is a, a particularly intrusive, becomes a particularly intrusive tool, tool in that end. Uh, and it's been increasingly used um, in protests uh, as well. And uh, whether it is the US, Hong Kong, UK, uh, all uh, around uh, the world, uh, there have been reports about using uh, these kind of tools to grab uh, data, all our data that we post on our profiles. And what's, what's ironic is that there, um, the social media companies themselves tend to hate this form of surveillance because uh, they don't want their platforms to be associated with government surveillance or surveillance by other uh, companies. So they try to stop this from happening when they care to. But the reality is um, governments are scraping, as you say, and there are also companies that, um, that are selling services to scrape uh, this, this data and to essentially reconstruct what has happened so they could pro possibly reconstruct a protest but then they could also monitor everybody who liked or saw or engaged with content online and now that 
uh, the U.S. government is now, um, if you visit the United States, as you fill out your forms in order to get uh, pre-cleared status or um, just the, uh, the ESTA forms, they are now starting to ask for your social media handle so that they can do this type of analysis on people to see, okay, did you like a, tr um, a Trump tweet or an anti-Trump tweet? And this feeds their determinations that you don't see behind um, the, the screen, that you don't see the determinations they're making about you as a result. We just, um, I mean, this is a really popular uh, form of surveillance. We just released a report, I think, yesterday, when we're recording this, two days ago when you'll hear, be hearing this, I think, no, three days ago, um, about uh, local councils in Britain using uh, Sockman, you know, without necessarily a huge amount of safeguards. Um, in America, according to uh, the Brennan Center, who did a big report about this, uh, around 60% of police say they contacted social media companies to obtain, obtain information uh, related to a suspect. And, you know, it's one of those things that people, you get told all the time to think about what you share online. Like that's fairly standard. I got told a lot of scare stories in high school, but um, when it comes to sharing images from protests, it's not you know, unreasonable to think about what you're giving away when you do that. Um, some of the suggestions I've seen people make are like, there are apps you can download to help you scrub metadata. You can take a screenshot of the photo and upload that rather than up directly uploading the photo. Um, but whatever you post online, it's telling the, essentially probably the police that you were at the protest. That shouldn't be a problem because you have a human right to be at the protest. And in America, you have the right to do things like take pictures of the police. Um, but the way that the policing response has been and um, in countries where you have fewer of those rights, uh, it can be hugely concerning uh, what is available um, on your social media and it's worth kind of thinking about it, even if there's a limited amount you can really do to, you know, um, prevent them from doing that as it stands again um you know we try not again there should be more safeguards and there should be more limits on what police are able to do um so you know talking joining campaigns against Sockman and reaching out to your local governments to ask for you know um better controls and regulations is an option i think <laughs> and this links back to what you were saying before uh, also about clearview ai uh caitlin where this company basically created its product by scraping the data from uh, all our social media accounts uh without knowing it and repurposing for a tool that now has been used to monitor protests and they're being clearviews being um I guess, I guess sued or they're being taken to court anyway in America, I think by the yes. ACLU. Yes. Yeah. And their, their defense or one of the defenses I've seen by a company similar is insane. It's like, we have a first amendment, right? Which in the U S is what free speech to steal your photos and get business kind of business, business advantage and make money off of them, which like in order to surveil you and make you less safe, like it's such an insane, unreasonable argument. It's really odd. And this is why the social media companies had better step up and they should be the ones taking legal action to protect the data that's that we share on their services. Otherwise, these social media companies are just enabling the surveillance state around protests, which is not going to help anybody. Um, yeah, which is just a worrying uh, sign of the times and a direction of democratic rights uh, for the future. And so just to finalize the, the, the review of the technologies, we've, we've looked at the technologies that are deployed at protests. We've looked at the technologies that, um, are, that capture data at protests that can then be used after protests. And then we've looked at social media uh, intelligence, which can happen whether it's before a protest to see who's organizing, who's talking about going to a protest, and then you can capture activities at a protest and activities after the protest. Then there's a final layer, um, which uh, essentially brings all of this data together. Um, so while facial recognition might be a, uh, 
a problematic technology in the sense it doesn't always necessarily work. Uh, MZ catchers are much more clear at, a, at grabbing very specific identifiers and social media intelligence is actually quite, the, the data comes in, in, in a digita, digitized format and relatively structured format, which you then feed into computers that these computers understand this type of data and they can map with extraordinarily, extraordinary detail what's actually going on. Do we have any examples of this type of aggregation and analysis techniques out there? Yes. Um, so I've found a couple of uh, examples of specific companies that are offering this kind of technology, um, particularly in the US. So in Minneapolis, um, Thomson Reuters have a, they have bought a tool like this by, from Thomson Reuters called Clear, which combines data, um, which combines, combines information from various sources, including your phone, including from um, AMPR, which is uh, the, light, the number plate readers, again, from arrest records that are going on at the moment, so in real time. Um, the NYPD have a surveillance platform uh, that they developed ages ago with, uh, with Microsoft, actually, um, which includes a huge number of cameras, uh, license plate readers, and weirdly uh, radiological sensors, um, which I'm not totally sure what that means, but the NYPD do have, um, they have the, the only example I could find of this technology and it's insane. They've got military vans essentially with X-ray technology um, that used to be used in Afghanistan. And for some reason they've decided that they need it in New York. Um, maybe that's what it's referring to, but radiological sensors are included in theirs. But essentially all of these aggregate tools take what we've already described as problematic surveillance and smush it, smush it all together to make following individual people and um, kind of trends a lot, lot easier for police because they get it packaged in a kind of almost easier to use platform, which is not what we want. <laughs> it's interesting you raised the... Uh... The, the military link because the this is not what police have traditionally done. Um, uh, police have only in the say in the past 10 to 15 years become uh, obsessed with intelligence led policing. And this is borrowing from the intelligence intelligence agencies who and, and it's their business to essentially accumulate all this data and do all of this real time analysis um, in order to, uh, to identify threats, but also predict threats. And they operate under a very different regime of law, but the police are supposed to be much more accountable, much more transparent, and yet they're using these systems and they're buying data from other sources uh, and using these types of uh, sensors that we know so little about and aggregating this data in real time and getting a view as to what is going on before us and after protest activities. This radically transforms your rights. Yeah, and as, as more and more things move into the digital world because it's more you know, easy, um, more efficient, or kind of simpler for people to use, and more and more information gets made available to these kind of platforms and, and to the police. Like in Hong Kong, one of the things people were worried about was there's an electronic payment ticket, I think called Octopus, um, that is really easy to use and is really popular in Hong Kong because it lets you move around the city really easily. Um, and suddenly when it came to protests, no one wanted to use them, potentially unsurprisingly, because police have used them in the past to track people because you know it's a unique kind of identifier that lets shows exactly where you, you've been moving and what you've been doing. So everyone was queuing up to use cash to buy paper tickets. And as more and more kind of things move into the digital space, police have more and more access to it. And like police are not, cautious when it comes to this technology often they see something shiny and they want it like there's no necessarily particular evidence that clearview is good at reducing crime that the kind of predictive policing that comes out of access to all of this data is good at you know um preventing or predicting crime or making police more efficient it's just mostly contributing to the over policing of particular communities um and often that means black communities and communities of color. So now that we've gone through this range of technology, you essentially scared the bejesus out of anybody listening, saying, okay, well, this just kills our democratic rights. It's all over, um, uh, but maybe I can do a few things. Um, what is there to do? And um, 
I, I, I enter this phase of the conversation with great reticence because if you look around online, there are so many um, self-styled gurus who are giving advice to people who want to go and protest um, and giving them advice as to what they should do in order to um, avoid being placed under surveillance. Or when, when there's commentary about surveillance, people say, oh, you should just dot, dot, dot. And all these types of uh, advice that we see aren't necessarily helpful and don't necessarily address the problem and sometimes could put people at greater risk. And so can we be a little bit more um, explicit about the guides that we have confidence in? I think the first thing it's worth remembering when you are going to a protest is you're not doing anything wrong. Like you're not committing a crime, you're, you're exercising rights that you absolutely already have. Like you're not doing anything wrong. So if you are uploading a picture at a protest or whatever, there's no, there shouldn't be an issue with that because you're not doing anything wrong. Having said that, a lot of people do get arrested at protests. So some of the first things that is useful to know are what are your rights uh, if you do get arrested? So in America, the ACLU have a load of really good guides about your specific rights. Um, in the UK, uh, Netpol are really, really good. Um, similarly, uh, the EFF have an attending a protest tool that's really useful. Um, in general, it is helpful to know if anyone's providing pro bono legal support in your area and you can search Twitter um, a lot of lawyers, particularly in America, are popping up to offer pro bono legal support. It's worth double checking they are who they say they are, um, but that can be a useful avenue. In the UK, uh, Green and Black Cross, who are a, um, a legal, uh, they're lawyers, oh my God, I forgot. They're a law firm, Jesus, and um, they've got a protest advice number. Um, in all of these situations, uh, if there are legal observers that you can find or there are protest um, advice lines, it's useful to write the number down on your arm because if you do get arrested and your phone does get taken from you, um, you won't have access to those numbers. So having it written on your arm is helpful because, it, you know, whatever happens, you've got it with you. Um, yeah. That's incredibly helpful. And it, it, it's important to understand uh First, like th th that, these are legal challenges that are are, are, are legal obstacles being uh, placed in your way. Knowing your your legal rights is an extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily important. Second, um, at a technical layer, go to the EFF um, motherboard. Also has some guidance on what you can do. But really, there is no technological fix to the 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 types of surveillance you're being subjected to. At protests, like there is no app for that. There's no singular thing you can do to circumvent them because a protest is a public act. You are putting yourself out there. You want to communicate these things, and you should be able to. You should be. Uh, it's not even permitted to. It is your right to be able to do these things. And what we need to do as privacy advocates and you as members of the public, we all need to make sure that this right exists into the future. And so we need to be putting pressure on political bodies, regulatory bodies, uh, legislative bodies to ensure that this right continues into the future uh, without regard to all the fancy toys that the the police and other organizations are putting out there in order to, uh, to essentially put obstacles in our way. And so, Ilya, I was wondering if you could talk through some of the work that we've been doing. Um, yes, sure. I, uh, I'm, it's amazing to be able to know your rights, but also hopefully when going to a protest, uh, you, you, you shouldn't be expecting you will need to defend them uh, afterwards. Sorry, I am diverting. Um, so over the past years, there are a lot of things um, PI has been doing in trying to um, mitigate some of the risks that have been emerging by the increasing surveillance in protests. One of the first things we've been doing is uh, monitoring what type of surveillance is being used, try to understand how it works, trying to understand what are the potential when using to, uh, when, when this technology is used uh, to alert 
uh, both uh, the people that they might be at risk, but also to push the regulators and the authorities to think through the, whether they need to be using this, these procedures, what are the legal frameworks that should be in place, and what are the procedures that should be in place when any of these new technologies has been, uh, has been deployed. Um, so, additionally to that, when we don't see any other avenue, when advocacy and pushing uh, the politicians to, to legislate better, in certain occasions where we have seen all the other avenues uh, being closed and where uh, politicians refuse to listen and authorities uh, uh, use uh, excuses like we can neither confirm nor deny that we're using this technology we have felt compelled to bring certain uh, of these uh, cases to courts to challenge uh, the use of uh, these technologies and to push for higher standards and better protections uh, for all of us um, that would uh, for all of us for a judicial decision that would permit us then to participate in, in protests better. Um, the other thing we've been doing is also we've been using uh, explainers such as uh, our neighborhood watch campaign, where we've been providing people with simple explainers on what kind of police, what kind of technology the police is using um and what questions should they be asking the police um to their local pol authorities uh, in order to find out what exactly what exactly exactly exact tools they're using and whether there is an appropriate legal framework and safeguards and effective oversight when any of these uh, are in place if you want to keep up with everything pi is doing and everything we will keep doing and are doing in the future. Um, I know there's some relevant work coming out not in the not too distant future, particularly about um, public private partnerships. Uh, when it comes to this kind of surveillance, you can uh, sign up for our email list at action.privacyinternational.org uh, and you can see lots of different things that you can keep up to date about us there. Well, this is a perfect time to thank Caitlin and Ivia for joining us today. And just to draw this um, to a close for now, this fight's not going away anytime soon. Protests are gonna become even more important as we go forward in the uncertain COVID and post COVID times. And we're gonna to have to address the fact that there's this entire industry of surveillance technology and this huge thirst and um, uh, hunger amongst policing agencies across the world to get more and more data. And the, the mechanisms that we have to fight against this, to, to mitigate, against, mitigate against both industry and government, to begin with, has to be transparency. And so you can work with us, you can work with local organizations across the world who are fighting for transparency over the technologies that are, to be, that are being deployed, trying to understand how the technologies work and how they don't work, how they fail and how they, um, they over-police, and try to establish what safeguards, if any, exist, and then take advocacy action to say, no, we shall not use this technology in this country in the same way that uh, San Francisco said, no, we shall not use, allow the use of facial recognition by the police. And we will also say that we will demand new safeguards in order to catch up to the way that technology works today. And we will say that th th these are the circumstances that this technology can be used and here are all the ways it cannot. Otherwise, we're going to see more abuses going forward and more protests and more people rounded up, not just in the United States, not just in Hong Kong, but in countries across the world where rights are even weaker. And we've got to stem this tide at these moments when people around the world are watching. Thank you for joining.
And if you uh, and thank you for listening. If you want to get involved with this topic, as Caitlin and Elia said, you can come to our website and look at some of our campaigns, particularly the Neighborhood Watch campaign, or as Caitlin said, go go to action.privacyinternational.org to sign up for our mailings specifically around these topics. We're also on all the social media that we just picked on, being Twitter, Instagram, uh, YouTube, and Facebook, but we're also on Mastodon. Um, and thank you for joining. The music is courtesy of Sepia.